Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face, they basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reach my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to the Confessionals Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. If you have a crazy, wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the contact section, and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me, just get a hold of me. If you want more shows on a weekly basis, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member. There you can get access to all the membership shows from the past, present, and future. Every show is released on Thursdays for members only, and you get access to the Tuesday shows ad-free and the overtime segments when they're available, all right there on theconfessionalspodcast.com or on the membership-exclusive app. So if you are interested in all that good good, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com slash join. And last but not least, friends, check out The Shape of Shadows and Expedition Dogman exclusively on Merkel.media. All you got to do is go to Merkel.media, hit stream now, and you'll be able to watch those films and The Shape of Shadows we just dropped not too long ago. And, you know, sometimes you're promoting something and it all just works out and it comes together. Because today I'm talking to you right now about The Shape of Shadows and checking out The Shape of Shadows. And we just so happen to have Ryan Burns on the show, the guy who owns the property that we spent a week on investigating out there that created the Shape of Shadows film. So Ryan, how are you today on this glorious Friday morning? Hey man, any day spent with you is my favorite day. So today is my new favorite day. <laughs> no, seriously. I, I love <laughs> yeah. having you on, man. And uh, listen, I, uh, I'm really glad that you and I have been able to build a relationship over the years. It all started from me driving a truck, watching you on Sam Tripoli's show in studio. And I was like, I got to talk to this guy. And uh, it turned into a film. You know, we went out there, shot the film. And, uh, you know, we released that, The Shape of Shadows. And, you know, your film or this film talks about your property a lot. You know, the Space Wolf Research. And uh, we've talked, you and I have talked uh, before on other recordings about the uh, the property and the upgrades to the property you've done and the activity and all that stuff. But we are not rehashing the Space Wolf Research property today. We will certainly do that down the road, I'm sure, because there's always going to be new developments happening and you're more than welcome to come on and talk about those things. But we're actually taking a, a, a different turn today because not too long ago, and I, you probably will have a better uh, memory as to when this happened, but in the city that you live in, in Vegas, there was news breaking like crazy. Like, and all I heard on this side of the country was that an alien spaceship landed in somebody's backyard in Vegas, and there were alien beings. It scared the people that were in the house, and the police came, and there's a body cam. 
footage of something falling from the sky. And we were like, we're being invaded. Then David Grush comes out and he's like, yeah, we're being invaded. And then the the Peru uh, face peelers are invading. And I'm just like, what's going on? Uh, but circling around the Vegas story and this whole thing with the aliens and the UFO landing in somebody's backyard, uh, it provided a very unique opportunity for you to investigate this story because you were in the same city. And uh, you actually did that. And I reached out to you. You said to me that you were doing that and stuff. And you know, you had, you had information to share. And it's one of those things where I, I'm like, oh, cool, let's get you on the show. But if I don't schedule you right away, I forget. And uh, it just so happened that this week I, I hit you up and about you know scheduling again. And you said, there's tons. There's tons of information. Six hours easy. And I'm just like, holy crap, what's going on here? But uh, you're here today to talk about your investigation into this whole story and how it unfolded for you. Uh, before we get into your investigation, though, I would like for you to take the opportunity to refresh people's memory as to what the maybe the official narrative is, what people were hearing in the news. What is the story that you investigated and, and why did you choose to investigate it? Great question, man. Great question. Yeah. Um, recapping the story, it is a situation that I believe will go down eventually. It's going to take some time, but it will go down eventually as the UFO story of the century. And it's one of those stories where people come out with uh, a scenario, an event. Obviously, they're scared. They call 911, but let's back up. So, a craft. Uh, we're going to start all the way at the beginning. So I don't, uh, th this is the Las Vegas aliens that landed in these, this family's backyard, but I'm going to back it up because it's important to have a breakdown of the events as they transpired, because it's easy to look at something and disregard it or not know what we're talking about if you don't have all the details. So it is the story where this family called 911 after they basically saw a craft land in a backyard, their backyard a home they had just moved into. And the police came out. And on the body cam footage of the police, police nearby as well, as well as all kinds of ring door cams in the area, I think there's 12 that I've, I've tracked down. There's this fireball in the sky. And uh, lo and behold, then we have a family calling 911 saying, aliens are in our backyard. They landed. The craft is back there. Get out of here. Okay. <laughs> That's what most people know about the story. Then all kinds of fake footage came out via TikTok, YouTube, and other social media platforms, which was easy to make people debunk the story. You know, oh, forget it. I'm not looking at this. There's already fake stuff drowning the story. In addition, uh, George Knapp, somebody that I trust and consider a friend and is also kind of a insider when it comes to this advanced working group of individuals, a lot of whom I've gotten information from. But he came out um, in mainstream news and was the first to break the story in mainstream news, so to speak, other than Newsmax, who I respect very much as well. And they're kind of interconnected. They are of the same ownership. But to not go off on a tangent, George Knapp came out showed the big circle in the backyard where purportedly this thing landed. Some YouTube investigator, which I respect them all, we need everybody who can do this stuff to chime in, pointed out that a year or so, maybe even a little more, a year and three months before, that he had a Google Earth image of the backyard also with that circle in it. So we lost a bunch more people. Oh, it's a hoax. It's a fake. It's that, the other. Arguably, though, these situations, as I researched it, happen time and time again in the same locations, these uh, interdimensional entities and craft typically stick to the same routes and landing spots, which I know sounds far-fetched, but if you gauge just how deep of a scar this is in the backyard, you know, it's not a four-wheeler that somebody's doing Brodies with, it's not there's a lot of vehicles that are moving around, front loaders and other heavy machinery. It's not that. And when Knapp went out with his team, he's a fairly seasoned UFO researcher. They thought it was noteworthy. And in my opinion, what I, I even uh, 
almost called a hoax and debunked the whole thing at that point. But as I looked into it and looked deeper into the history of the property, proximity to certain routes, uh, specifically routes that have to do with the Kingman, Arizona retrieval uh, of a UFO and the group that was kind of put together, put together to retrieve that. And I'll name some names here in a minute. But it seems this is not the first time that unidentified aerial phenomena has taken this route. And it's very likely, in my opinion, that this is not the first time that these entities just so happen to land in a very populated area in one of the biggest backyards around. Uh, I think they knew exactly where they were going, what they were doing, and stopped for a reason. So that being said, super important because... Until I looked deeper into it, I thought that was, you know, hoax-worthy as well. But it just actually ended up lending more evidence, thank goodness, to something that as the deeper and deeper I look, the more of these interesting red flags you see that lend credence to it being a very real big deal scenario. Wow. Yeah, I'm... I'm really excited about hearing what has unfolded and how it transpires. Uh, for full transparency, uh, the, the audience listening, you and I attempted this yesterday and I didn't uh, like how the we were like 20, 30 minutes in and I didn't like how the conversation was going. And I said, we had to scrap this and try again tomorrow. Uh, but the reason why is because of what you just did there. You kind of talked about uh, the background of this story. And we kind of skipped that yesterday and kind of started diving into the investigation. And I didn't want to assume everybody was understanding where we were going with what story we're even talking about. Uh, but with the information that you've uncovered, which is plentiful. In fact, you you sent me, uh, a, a, when, when we started scheduling this, you sent me a, a picture of a post-it note on your computer that had just these all this wild stuff that I guess it pertains to this story, which was a uh, no knock warrant, MIB, redacted 16 minutes of audio and video, neighbor, lost city connections, advanced working group, FAA logs, lawyers, and Nest. And I'm just like, well, that just sounds like everything. And I, I dig it all. And so um, I'm really excited to hear how this all kind of comes together. Uh, yesterday, you even mentioned about these entities, which is this part of. Um, the story I never heard of. And I don't know if it came up throughout your investigation or if this is something that got lost in the mix, but that these entities, it wasn't that these people just heard or, or saw these entities, but it was that these things were actually on the roof of the house or something like that. Is that, is that correct? 100% for sure. So yeah, uh, I am that along with a bunch of other stuff started letting me realize this is the real big deal. Um, not only that, the fact that it took 28 days for the story to come out as if somebody was literally suppressing it on purpose, that there was, there was a suppression taking place. So yeah, these, the, this family is, um, spiritual and when basically to kind of go deeper into the, the night of the event, this brother, and Angel, who is um, one of the sons, were in the backyard, and they it's a big backyard. And they were using this space to kind of work on vehicles, you know, to make a few extra bucks. And uh, it was later than usual that they were out there in the backyard working on a vehicle. They were both under the hood of a vehicle, you know, and working when this thing lands. And when it lands, they both kind of come out from under the hood of the vehicle to kind of set the stage. They see it. They're, you know, young and strong and in their prime and they're together. There's more than one of them. So they start walking over. I mean, it's their house. It's their backyard. Um, and so they start walking over towards this craft. And as they were walking towards the craft, they encountered what can only be described as a cloaking technology, a smoke screen or something that visually impaired them to the point where they couldn't quite make out, even though they were in close proximity, they couldn't quite make out everything the way they did initially. And they also felt as if time itself sort of slowed down, that they were literally, their steps were taking longer than usual. And this is a common situation in these events where these interdimensional non-human intelligences have the ability to literally, you know, adjust 
and manipulate the time scenario. You got to remember time is a human construct. So they can actually slow that down in our minds somehow. Well, during this period, they quickly realized that they were up against something far beyond their expertise. And they rushed inside the house, told other family members, you know, woke people up, told them what's going on. They quickly gathered in a prayer circle, which I, I, I would have to admit I would do the same. And as they were praying it up, these entities literally scurried up onto the roof. These things were huge, uh, according to some accounts, up to 10 feet tall, if not bigger. So they scurried up onto the roof. They could hear them clawing and scurrying right directly above where the prayer circle was and being very anxious and not happy, apparently, that this prayer circle was taking place, which lent credence to the belief that, as Angel has said, he believes that these had some demonic, uh, something demonic about them, right? So that's kind of what happened that night. Wow. That's crazy. And so that from that point, they, what, they called the police and the police came out and did their investigation, which people are familiar with. So um, with that, with this, all this information, where do you come in? Where does this, this investigation start off for you? Because uh, I know you have a lot of different uh, information, like the, even the, 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 the container or whatever this is on the back of the property, which is kind of suspicious. I know you kind of danced around it a little bit when you were talking about it before to me, uh, but where, where do you start in this investigation? What are some of the information that you started uncovering and how does this all unfold for you? Great question. Um, I was, to be honest, sort of, even though it's literally right in my backyard here in Vegas, uh, this is my neck of the woods as well as shapeshifter territory up in the Uinta Basin. I bounce back and forth monthly um, and investigate up there mostly. But yeah, even though it was right here, you know, I too was kind of like trying to, you know, deem whether or not this was uh, worth, I'm, I'm one of those like zero all or nothing guys, right? Um, and I was like, oh, if you go into this, you're going to really go into this. So I, I wanted to deem that it was legit. And, uh, the esoteric is something that when you ignite that in me, I do not stop. And so we have to look at this event, which I believe to be one, if not the most important alien UFO contact cases of the century. And when it happened, it happened on the evening of Walpurgis night. And from an esoteric perspective, this is during the one hour period when historically, from this perspective, these things, these others, these non-human intelligences are known and documented throughout human history to literally come into our reality. And they're able to traverse the veil from the other side dimensionally and enter our realm more easily. So I know this is very esoteric, but I believe there's no such thing as coincidence when it comes to the esoteric. So during this witching hour, so to speak, as they call it, the hour between the transition between Walpurgis night and Beltane, this takes place. Now, for those that are going to say, oh, you know, we can look over that and ignore that. I ask that you just take a moment to fully understand the implications of how rare and impossible this would be. It's a huge deal. So <clears throat> Walpurgis night is a quick abbreviation for the eve of the Christian feast of the day of the saint Walperga, who was literally canonized as a saint in medieval times for praying these entities away from these small communities that literally saw this as an extreme lethal danger. And I know what you're thinking, far-fetched. Well, not really, because if they canonized her over this, it's probably a big deal. And she had other miracles as well, but there's two times of the year, bi-yearly. Walpurgis night going into Beltane. And keep in mind, this is the end of April, beginning of May. And to give you an idea how important this is, many of the super class and power elites consider Beltane one of the most important esoteric holidays of the year. And when you hear pilots going down in their planes or other aircraft, they always say, Mayday, Mayday. That's because that means the end is imminent. This is lethal. This is dangerous. And it comes from this time period this hour. So there's one hour that's the end of April going into May 1st from midnight to 1 a.m. That's exactly when this craft touched down. And there's the other hour, which everybody knows super well, which is Sam Hain or Halloween, midnight to 1 a.m. That's just when the goblins, the ghouls, the demons, the interdimensionals come through into this liminal state and enter our realm. 
once that was ignited in me and I was like timing everything with the body cams and everything, and it was like literally right then, mathematically impossible. So that's when I literally, you know, charged like a bull into this and every layer that I uncovered lent more credence to the reality that this was a real event. Hmm. So from there though, I mean, where, where are we, where do you go as far as launching this investigation? Um, feel free to use the notes that you were using yesterday if you want uh, to kind of keep yourself in order or whatever. I'm fine with that. Uh, I, I think uh, it's important for this information to be get, to get out. Uh, and so, you know, take us, take it away. Yeah. Okay. So I, at that point, I just, I jumped in my car. I grabbed a, uh, uh, like radiation, uh, like detector. A, like a Geiger counter. Yeah. A Geiger counter. Nice. I grabbed all the goodies. There's stuff all over my desk. It's a mess in here. Anyway, I grabbed everything. I packed up the vehicle. I'm like, honey, if I don't come back, call the sheriff. They probably arrested me. Wow. So I go down to the property and immediately, man, I get out of my vehicle and, you know, this guy comes rushing up to me and he's like, oh, you guys are back already. And I was like, well, wait a minute, what? And keep in mind that I drive a very black suburban like tinted out government looking vehicle. I have toddlers. I need the space. But overall, if you just saw this thing, you would just assume this guy's a government, especially the way I dress, you know, like Costco casual. So, um, the guy came over and he's like, you guys are back. And I go, Oh no, 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 I'm not, I'm not with the government. And he goes, yeah, they've been, man, it's just been like a revolving door, black suburbans, government types, all kinds of agencies. This is a neighbor in very close proximity. And he, te- he just goes on to report to me some of the most unbelievable stuff. I mean, my jaw dropped. I literally talked to this guy and he was telling me, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a scandal. It was chaos. You know, I, I saw it. I saw them. You know, they were at least 10 feet tall. And I'm not the only one. And he started pointing at like other neighbors that had seen the same thing. So... Whatever was going on at that point, I believe was a very real deal. And keep in mind, from the time this craft landed, they went inside, they came back out armed to the hilt. The family came out with all the guns. Um, very, very, you know, spiritual family, but also not stupid. And uh, they came out with their weapons. And I know you can relate to that. Oh, yeah. They, uh, they went in the backyard and there's footage of them literally going into the backyard armed to the hilt seeing something that frightened them so much that they literally scurried back out of the backyard. Grown men, armed, the reality is there. Uh, So, moving forward, these entities apparently were in, I've timed it down to almost the minute, analyzing body cam footage, analyzing the dispatch call, analyzing neighbors' testimonies, And from my understanding, these things were in the backyard, basically 38 minutes. That's a long time for two 10 foot tall tarantuloid looking, uh, massive non-human entities to be traipsing around the backyard. And they got anxious. There was a point where one of them got into a front loader and tried to fire it up. I mean, this becomes very real when this thing is trying to hotwire a front loader in your backyard and it's not human. And there's some footage on TikTok and other platforms that if you clean it up, sure as heck, you either have somebody that's really tall with a big bulbous mask on. And even though it's grainy, you can make it out. The light was low. But as far as the family goes, I 100% believe their testimony. And I know that there was uh, some racial aspects to the case where they are from the Hispanic culture, as I am as well. In fact, they come from Panama, and I'm from Costa Rica, which is literally that shares a border. But they also have an interesting uh, gypsy DNA background, so their lineage, which, as we know, oftentimes these non-human intelligences, aliens, if you want to get into the crazy semantics of it or call them whatever you want to call them, these liminal entities have a tendency to follow interesting locations, interesting genetic lines. And keep in mind, they'd only been in this house for about 30 days at this point. 
almost the same amount of time as it took for the story to come out. So it keeps going from there. The house is owned by an LLC with an interesting background. I've looked into all the ownership, how it's changed hands. I could come out with the name of the LLC and I so super want to because the coincidence doesn't stop there, but I don't want to dox any, any, anything like that. Um, also the, uh, the house already had cameras on it. And according to sources that are in the defense intelligence agency and in the community, they, in their opinion, 100% have proof that there was a previous renter to this property who was also the subject of a Homeland Security investigation. If it had to do with something landing in the backyard as well, I don't know. But the, cam- the cameras were already on the house. Some, some cameras, not all of them. Homeland Security later on put more cameras on the house, which totally goes against code, totally goes against every procedure in the book, which again, l- lends more credence to this. And we can go any direction you want. I've got pages and pages of notes. Where do we want to go, man? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't have the pages of notes like, like you do. I, I will say I never heard of tarant- tarantaloids until you said it. And I just looked it up. And I, it, it says here that, uh, one, they're ugly looking insect alien entities that can take uh, the look of humans, specifically uh, blonde humans. But uh, it says here, the best knowledge of uh, tyrannoloids were slash are the sole species abducting uh, Earth humans for three primary reasons. General experimentation of Earth humans, detailed analysis of our species, and trial crossbreeding between Earth humans and tyrannoloid species. That's interesting. Uh, so, like, I mean, is that... And I don't even know what this website is. It just it, the website is uh, thinkaboutit.site slash aliens slash tyrannoloids. So people can check that out. Love it. Want. Yeah. I, I hadn't heard of that either, Tony. This blew my mind. But um, apparently, there's more to this. What were they doing there, right? Were they there on an abduction scenario? They might be. This was late at night. They may have been assuming that this family, you know, most, unless you're a super class power elite pulling the strings of reality, you probably are not celebrating Beltane, like in a yeah. hooded party somewhere. So this um, was an hour that most people are asleep. And it's not only the darkest hour of the year, or th- there's only two dark hours of the year, and it's one of them. So it's not only the darkest hour of the year, it's the darkest entities, the darkest place. I mean, it's Sin City, the worldwide capital of sin, sex, gambling, and overall debauchery. You have this trifecta of coincidence, and it doesn't stop there. The family had just moved into the home around a month or so earlier, and possibly the most mysterious is there is a storage container. There's many, many articles uh, that were owned by the LLC and the ownership that were already in the backyard. It's a really big backyard for a metropolitan area. I want to stress that really big. And um, among the mysterious things back there, the most mysterious is a storage container that I can't discuss completely, but I can say that it has power to it. It's utilized in government projects um, due to uh, its ability to house ammunition, pharmaceuticals, radioactive materials, and it has uh, fire suppression systems that can be employed and put in. So, not your average storage container and i own multiple storage containers so this is kind of like my jam right yeah so when i saw this story <laughs> we, yeah. we know all about the storage containers on your properties <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean again this gets fairly top secret really quick when talking about containers that you have to go to airforce.mil websites that track you to look into and you know they're dedicated to the explanation of how these containers can be outfitted what they're commonly used for. So all I can say at the moment is they're really expensive. They're awesome. And they're used by the military a lot, namely the air force. That's interesting. So, uh, I, I know you're, you're dancing around the information that you actually know about this, but it's the, it seems like this property is deeply ingrained with governmental forces. Is that safe to say? Yeah, we, we've talked about this off, uh, a little bit off of, uh, not recorded lines and it's, it's, so yeah, this, Okay, so this landing took place to kind of deflect, but not deflect. I'm going to come back around, I promise. This landing took place in close proximity to Bigelow Aerospace Corporation in North Vegas, a place I'm very familiar with 
because the owner used to own a property known as the Sherman Ranch, which shares a fence line with SpaceWolfResearch.com, the base camp up in the Uinta Basin, where you guys camped out for a week. And it's a place of importance to national security. If you just drive by this place, there's two, two layers of razor wire. There are literally security guards fully armed with AR-15s on ATVs going around this place in North Vegas. And um, anyway, to, to note how important it is to national security, it's important to note that it's the, the, the most, basically, period, the, the most highly classified projects and programs during our existence uh, utilize this location as more or less a headquarters to operation, including the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program and the Advanced Aerospace Weapons Special Application Program, both secretly funded by Congress to study UFOs and assess threats with broad missions extending from UFOs and military research to super strange paranormal topics that they were trying to possibly weaponize. So. This location is also home to what's known as BASS, B-A-A-S-S, or the Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies Group, the same group who fulfilled the U.S. government contracts to study UFO and paranormal, paranormal subjects, including Utah Skinwalker Ranch. It's because of them we know about the Tic Tac, the Nimitz, everything that you know that has come out in the news about UFOs being real is because of these guys and contracts that they were involved with. So don't know where to go from here. Wow. Do you think that there's a connection between this, this event in this people backyard and the, this organization? I mean, so I have to be really careful because there, this is when you start to realize how many layers to this onion there is and the reality of what's taking place. Okay. So what I can say is, we have a defense intel intelligence agency black budget projects headquartered in close proximity to the house in Vegas where this took place. And keep in mind that all UFO reports and FAA flight logs are directed to Bigelow Aerospace. In fact, I've gone with top Siemens uh, engineers, you know, who are into this and showed them the property. And they commented on how unique the communications array is on top of this property. It is quite literally the tip. It, it is the top of the capstone of intelligence. It is literally from a military contractor perspective. If you're talking about uh, plausible deniability, it's the top of the top. Every, every you, if you report a UFO anywhere, MUFON, the FAA, the Air Force, the Navy, if you report it anywhere, the information goes to them. And this um, top Siemens engineer explained that the array of communication on the top of this building only comes in. It doesn't go out. Nothing leaves. Zero information or data leaves this building, only constantly streaming inward. And um, as I often say, he's like definitely somebody that uh, I respect very much, but all roads lead to Bigelow. And I often say, you know, what would Bob do? When I'm, when I'm in a quandary and in a position with the paranormal that I don't know what to do, I think to myself, what would Bob do? Because this guy has done it right, in my opinion, before any of this was just for entertainment purposes or a TV show. This guy, behind the scenes, has been doing everything right since he first entered the field. And we're, we're barely scratching the surface on this case. So, um, you know, according to sources of mine, all the flight logs two days before the event and two days after the event in the backyard, including the night when it happened, were removed from the record for study and analysis. And that's all I can say. I can't say who removed them oh. or who has the power to remove them and who can put them back. And that's including flight logs out of McCarran Airport. That's including flight logs that you should be able to go and say, you know, did my wife's plane come in at this time on that day? Gone for a while while they're analyzing all this. Wow. Wow. And oh my gosh. So they're removing flight logs. So they, they're definitely giving credence to this whole event. Uh, and when you said that you arrived on scene and the neighbor came up to you and thought you were government, that says that, that it's a high traffic area, at least post the event. And the event happened. And then you found out about it a month later, essentially. 
through with the rest of the world. So it makes me wonder if that entire month there were that nobody was talking about it. If the government was showing up and 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 dealing with this on the low, uh, do you think that this story was released on purpose, or do you think that uh, it leaked out and that's why there was this synchronicity with uh, David Grush and his claims and whistleblowing? Do you think this 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 story is connected to David Grush at all? With because I mean it happened like within a week of each other. You know, David Grush comes I'm out. I'm so glad you bring this up. Uh, information is power. I hate to take that, you know, from Alex Jones and the whole InfoWars thing, but when that guy named that, you know, he, he got the name right, maybe. Uh, but um, yes, to answer your question partially, and I'm glad you mentioned David Grush because he becomes an important character in this. There were multiple congressional testimonies that, First of all, in my opinion, the city of Las Vegas. Okay, so I got to be careful because I live here. Um, and there's people that can make phone calls. And we'll get into some of these people, namely Sasha Larkin and Kevin McMahill, the sheriff. There's people that can make one phone call and end me. Uh, Sasha Larkin is involved with the Homeland Security. She's the head of Homeland Security here. And the other one is obviously the sheriff, which we'll get into just how much power. He has like 10 times more power than usual sheriffs in usual counties nationwide. So, yes, there are some patterns here. And um, where do we go? Let's see. In my opinion, this was suppressed to be used at a later time when they could deflect from another situation taking place in front of Congress as if to, uh, well, we had, we had, Stephen Greer with whistleblower testimony. And this literally came out, I believe the same day or the next day as, and this was a multi-day event and this came out at the same time. So all these whistleblowers were literally, you know, swearing testimony in Washington, DC. And there was nobody there. There was zero journalists on site. Uh, because everybody was focused on this Las Vegas case, which came out 20 or it came out 30 days later. I think I was privy to it 28 days, but basically, yeah, it was like, literally it was suppressed for 30 days. And they usually say that if you can suppress something for that long, uh, at least from a public relations perspective, it will lose interest in the public eye. So, Oh, old news move on. So anyway, um, where do I go from here? So let, let's go into some of the scientific, we mentioned the data flight radar and let's go into some of the scientific data flight radar before we're coming back to literal Clark County authorities and their part in this. So the UFO came from the area of Bishop, California, or at least that's where they began tracking it. And by they, I mean government agencies with three and four letters. And the UFO was first spotted in the vicinity of a place called Crowley Lake near Bishop, California. That's where it first popped into radar. And if you've ever had the opportunity to see uh, the stone columns at Crowley Lake, this is a very, I think I sent you an image of it, very uh, alien looking archaeological anomaly that even scientists are like, well, we know it's naturally occurring because it can't be anything else, but we don't know how it happened. And it looks super alien. It's cavernous. It looks like exactly the type of place, if you were making a science fiction movie, where you would have a UFO pop out of the water. Then we have the UFO coming. Uh, so anyway, uh, <laughs> it looks weird. So then we have the UFO popping eastward over very, uh, let's just call it sensitive airspace. And at this point, all, all the, all, it moved east over airspace that if you or I flew over, we'd be shot down. And then in the direction of Mesquite, Nevada, before dropping down into the Las Vegas Valley and in the backyard of this family who had to call 911 to deal with the situation. After the debacle in the backyard, and obviously being found out, the craft again finally became airborne after about 38 minutes, given a couple seconds here and there, the reports vary, but regardless, it gets moving again. And I'm pretty sure the timeline offers itself to, uh, this thing going in the direction of Lake Mead as far as like the trajectory and radar data and telemetry. Interestingly, on a side note, other past, and I kind of touched on this, other past crash recovery teams have tracked and followed and recovered 
craft historically along this exact trajectory, exact trajectory, at least if you believe the information coming out of the crash retrieval event of 1953 near Kingman, Arizona, just outside of town, and at least a half dozen other more crash retrieval type events of the UFO variety, according to many solid leads and verified by researchers of all kinds, including Preston Dennett, one I just did a panel with and talked to him. Um, we, so the craft is following this route that many other craft have followed. And it seems to me that, you know, everybody at this point is aware of it in the three and four letter agencies. By now, after flying over sensitive airspace, landing in the backyard, causing all kinds of ruckus unlike ever before, having the police literally called on it, and just basically being a menace, every X-File-like desk in Washington is all over this thing and its radar signature. So on the past UFOs that kind of have followed this route, it appears that we can shoot these things down as we did with the Kingman craft. And we have followed this route with scientists like Arthur Stansel, metallurgists like Leonard Stringfield. They've been on scene on some of these retrievals. And uh, David Grush comes into play here because he kind of verifies some of these evidentiary, you know, topics that the government won't say, oh, we can't, we can't admit to that. But the long story short is it was tracked and targeted. It went into an area of Lake Mead as near as we can tell, to avoid being possibly shot down. And the coordinates we were given to investigate by boat on the lake, I mean, I went all out, dude, um, were extremely in- accurate. So we, we, this information came from a deep intelligence asset with a proven track record. Someone, my other source, who is a private investigator for government contracted information gathering, also thinks is a very legitimate source. And he's somebody who... I'll just leave it there. He's somebody that, yeah, in our community, he's a well-known name and proven 100% legit. So um, the coordinates led us to some pretty interesting things. You know, we had two coordinates and what we found was right in the middle of the the two. And it wasn't, I wish I could say that I noticed this. I, I gassed up the boat. If you saw my garage, there's so much stuff around my boat that I would do anything in the world, anything in the world to not take the boat out. Anything. Because I have to take out, it's literally like an hour and a half of taking stuff out, then taking the boat out, gassing it up and driving an hour to the lake because uh, it takes forever. The boat ramps are hellish. The water was super low at that point. It's not when you want to take your boat out. I would do anything to not do it, but I'm getting these like amazing coordinates from these. Anyway, I had to do it. So long story short, this other epic researcher that's with me that doesn't want to come forward with his name because he can't his job depends on it um as we're driving along he's like hey dude what's that and i was like it's not what we were looking for we were looking for like the crashed remnants of like a crashed remnants of a ufo or telltale signs of radiation signatures and we did see dead fish which was a little weird um which could be attributed to radiation but that's not what he saw he saw something that appeared well, to be uh, a whole other rabbit hole, which is this lost city archaeological site, which I didn't think was real. But he basically saw remnants of an ancient civilization What in the lake. Now, keep in, yeah, keep in mind, the lake's super low. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I'm like, this is like out of this world. Like, this is stuff you would see on the History Channel at like 3 a.m., you know, like mind-blowing. And, um, yeah, he sees this... Uh, these remnants of an ancient civilization right there in the water. Is this on Crowley Lake? And he, I, I didn't, so this is in Lake Mead. Okay. Dude. Wow. Wow. So, wow. Okay. So I thought this is crazy. Not possible. Never expected it. And to be clear, um, smack dab between the two GPS coordinates. So, Oh, where do I go from here? Absolutely amazing find. Regardless, I started looking into it. We checked it out. As I said, the lake was super low then. It's rained a lot since then. I don't think you could probably even see this stuff anymore. But to see these remnants of an ancient civilization, you know, right there where we're looking, searching into the fact of whether or not there's any possibility of a UFO going in. And we know that UFOs typically, you know, like to land in these spots like ancient civilizations, Cusco, Peru, 
uh, like the recent situation in the Alto Nanai with the Peruvian jungle. Um, they like this ancient civilization aspect because they probably helped build it according to some of the information I gathered. So anyway, this, this information nearly floored me and stopped me at any time. But in my searching and research, as I found old newspaper articles, which I sent you some from 1924, describing ruins of a lost city to be buried under Boulder Dam, as they called it then, not Hoover Dam. And this lost city was officially known as Pueblo Grande and even has a small museum dedicated to it way up in the middle of nowhere, Logan, Logandale, Overton area of Nevada, which I went and visited the museum and like bothered the hosts and hostesses for like hours. So the research is real. This thing existed. And it's one of those Smithsonian like cases where, okay, after researching this lost history, they've literally tried to suppress this too. I've lived in Vegas for six, seven years. Everybody I've talked to, they're like, what are you talking about? There's not a city under, there's actually two. There's actually two, but I'll get to the second one later. There's not a city under there. But apparently, not only was this location, Pueblo Grande, important from an archaeological perspective, but it may have been the oldest city and civilization in North America, period. Could be up to 5,000 years old may have been, you know, predating the Egyptian pharaoh times. And I don't know where you want to go from here because it gets so crazy. They found giant skeletons. They found all this stuff. There, there's so much to go into. Th- this is right where the UFO purportedly went into the lake. Right. Okay. So okay. So, tell me about the second city because you said we're going to get to that. Okay. I, the, I, second I city's <laughs> not, the second city's not as big a deal. It was a Mormon community. That I guess okay. So the fifties with the with the uh, Central Water Project, they were just damming up water and making things happen. They could care less about what they were covering up. In fact, in many cases, including Pueblo Grande, this lost city, and this other Mormon encampment, they didn't even realize that these things would be covered. They didn't even know they were there until the water was like there. They had these groups like the Smithsonian, the CCC, which has since been disbanded, but these other Smithsonian-like groups literally following the waterline in some cases and being like, oh, whoa, like, look what we have here. And that's the case with this lost city. If this thing is possibly as old, it's for sure minimum a thousand years old. Maximum, we don't know. But some have ventured to say maybe 5,000 years old. If it's that old, our science says that people could not have built this. They would have had to have extraterrestrial or some kind of help to build these things. And the mind-blowing stuff, man, is that, okay, from estimations, they were on, only able, in, in all the literature I was able to gather, and it's hard to find these articles, it's hard to find this evidence, they were only able to access the top three layers of the city remnants. So there were three, or I'm sorry, the top layer of the city remnants, there were three more layers of city below it. And due to the rising waters and mud, they could only access the top layer. So they started digging down and realized, oh my gosh, there's one, there's two, there's three more layers, but we can't get down there. The mud's too deep. The water's coming up and mind blowing um, from an archaeological perspective in especially the history of the United States. We have a UFO coming out of the water at an intriguing location, an ancient geographical anomaly with caverns and columns at Crowley Lake near Bishop, California. And then we have it retreating or going, you know, trans using that trans medium ship, which is the highest top secret. I'll get into that. That's the biggest deal with David Grush is this trans medium ship. When he brings that up, everybody starts, shh, 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 don't talk about the fact that they can go into the water. But um, when it goes into the water in possibly one of the oldest civilizations in North America, if not the oldest, and some of the lost history researchers believe that some of these ancient civilizations in the United States date back 5,000 years, it's very likely that these entities knew exactly where they were going, you know, and um, timelines don't exist. So I don't know, man, uh, we mm. can go all kinds of directions. So the, though going into the water, uh, do you think then that this could be something that's like a, an ancient alien civilization or ancient uh, alien base that's just active or or is this more interdimensional where by going into the water, you're actually piercing through a veil or a portal of some kind into another realm as you go through this water? I mean, like, you know, you know what I mean? Like there's so many different, because 
David talks about the NHI and uh, and the the interdimensional aspects of this. Uh, and then you're mentioning about the transmediumship where like these things have the ability to go into the water. That's supposed to be a big hush hush thing. Well, why is, should it be a big hush hush thing unless there's something else happening once it goes into the water? You know, like the idea of of submersible submersible objects is nothing new. We we can do that. So why is it so fascinating that these things can go from sky to water? I mean, other than you know the technological aspects of it, but it's it's not. Uh, it's like big deal. You know, we're talking about things that pretty much can stop on a dime in, in the air and hover and all that stuff. Who cares if it can go into water unless there's something else happening once it pierces the water? Man, Tony, you always have the best questions. You lead it so perfect, man. So it's not a hush hush thing unless it's a grush thing. And that's, I say that <laughs> I because that. <laughs> as we know, and I'm so glad you brought David into this, as we know, UFOs have these transmedium abilities. And they can go from air to water and back. And we also know that UFOs like to visit locations of ancient archaeology, such as Machu Picchu, Cusco, Peru. Um, and I believe this case with the Pueblo Grande site in Nevada. And speaking of Peru, the Peruvian alien attacks, which happened shortly thereafter with these similar creatures flying around a meter off the ground and terrorizing villagers in the Alto Nanay. This this happened shortly after the Las Vegas encounter, and the descriptions of the size, etc., are super similar. We find this in the similarities between the Kingman UFO crash as well, retrieved, and the 2023 Las Vegas alien backyard incident. Same route, and the craft size and shape are exactly the same. So they seem to line up exactly. So the team that was organized are also very similar as well to the team from a number of different other agencies allowing not only for higher top secret clearances like David Grush's, but actively with top secret, what they call top secret slash SCI with CI and LS polygraph security clearance protocols, where they literally polygraph you to and from some of these locations, basically way up there in layman's terms from a top secret perspective, almost above top secret and add the need to know system of classification classification as with david grush and the clearance is in the stratosphere no pun intended literally less than one in a million even have the lower semblance of an idea of what's going on and then you add the need to know and um one of our sources has that clearance and in fact it's that high and it's like david grush just recently got his clearance reinstated because nothing he said was wrong and they tried to pull that clearance they had to give it back to him. So the scientific problem here with cases like this one, it's huge, is that um, UFO reports have never been analyzed as manifestations on a global scale. And we, we basically, in other words, we like, we like to keep the information super close to the trust and compartmentalize it. We don't want anyone else to have it. So um, we're not, we don't care about it. Until recently, in other words, with like the Peru alien incident where they're terrorizing villagers in the Alto Nanay, as soon as these events cross country boundaries, the investigation stops. And mankind is kind of holding these files so close to the chest in bunkers somewhere um, that it never comes out. That being said, this is all beginning to change with David Grush, with the Declaration of Space Force, uh, and who happened to, in fact, be in the area during the Peruvian alien situation space force and who does. Yeah. So they interact on a limited basis with the worldwide community of intelligence assets in the field of what they call space domain awareness. And so this is a good thing. And in the case of the Peru aliens, there was a space force joint operation in an area nearby along the coast, which points to more, more congruently in my opinion, to the events on hand, and the legitimacy, in my opinion, again, that these events were connected in so much as the proximity and timing of like similarities in the descriptions of the aliens reported or non-human entities. And there are uh, more authoritative departmental clues and cues that lead me to believe that these were not only connected, but they are tied to the Vegas incident. We had... There, there's a lot going on in the Peruvian jungle too that leads 
more credence to the Vegas incident. You know, uh, Tim Alberino just went to Peru and uh, was on the ground there and was talking with the locals. He actually talked to a little girl who was uh, they attempted to abduct. And uh, he has some very interesting takes on it. Um, and I think, if I remember correctly, I was watching his video like in passing yesterday, his debrief on it. Uh, I believe he's come to the conclusion that uh, what ex- what was experienced there quite possibly might be a joint operation between ET and human. Is that something that, that would line up with your thinking too? Yeah, there is... There's so much evidence going into that joint op, what Space Force was doing and how things were handled and what they were pulling in, the gear that they were pulling into the coastline. Space Force is the coolest thing because everybody knows there's a Space Force. Nobody knows what they do. And, uh uh-huh. Yeah, and I mean, and I think Tim was smart to wait like a quarter of a year to go down there because things were pretty hectic with like the the miners, the drug cartels, the political agenda taking place at the time. I think he he was smart waiting until things calmed down, so to speak, because so basically it's it's similar to the authorities here in, in, in the United States. And this is just how stuff is handled, especially by all authorities. But here in the Las Vegas alien scenario, like the lower level authorities, I hate to call them that, but not necessarily the feds, as we know. The state-level authorities are easier to analyze. And even here, um, the highest position held by local law enforcement is that of Kevin McMahill, who is the sheriff of Clark County. And somebody who is different than almost all other counties in the United States in that the sheriff in Clark County has statutory duty of providing service of process in civil and criminal cases above all other authorities and personnel employed or sworn into duty. So even if you're elected, which means he has more power than anyone else in the legal process and decides how investigations and everything else related go down, right? So what's weird, it's not the norm nationwide, it's just here. And interestingly, Clark County sheriffs are also held to a higher legal standard As an example, um, the former sheriff of Clark County, a former sheriff of Clark County, is facing 15 felony charges, including official misconduct. Um, And he was arrested just a day ago. His name's Jamie Noel. And I just mentioned that to note the differences between Clark County sheriff power and nationwide sheriff power. Usually sheriff is just somebody that's chasing those good old Duke boys, you know, down a, not here. Here is like a whole other whole other deal. And I have to be super careful about this next part about how he or the head of Homeland Security here in Vegas, these two people I'm about to talk about could literally end anyone with one phone call. So let the walking on eggshells begin. Um, The current head of Homeland Security Division of L. VMPD is a, a woman named Sasha Larkin. And she was trained uh, by another individual who I won't mention his name, who uh, through an FBI contact of mine, this guy got really worried when he realized that Sasha Larkin had got into this case and put live streaming cameras on top of the house. And under the guise of like, well, hey, you guys saw this. This is to keep you safe. You know, we're going to we're going to put there are already cameras on the house by the LLC, but we're going to put Homeland Security cameras and listening devices all over this property to keep you safe. Well, the guy that trained her reached out to this FBI friend of mine and very well known guy said, you know, I'm I'm taking her out. I'm going to I'm taking her down. This is not how I trained her to do this. This is completely illegal. This cannot happen. And she's going against every protocol that I trained her on what to do. My FBI friend contacted me. He's like, oh, dude, it's going to hit the fan. It's going to hit the fan unless there's something really going on that's above everybody's, you know, above top secret. So come to find out, and I have to be careful how I say this, there are issues 
between how do I put this? There's issues between Sasha Larkin and the sheriff, Kevin McMahill, that are interpersonal in nature. And these issues, uh, these issues can be found online, but I'm not going to be the one to say it. So there's issues between the head of Homeland Security Division of the Las Vegas Metro Police Department. And Kevin McMahill, who literally is the most powerful uh, law enforcement authority in the land, where usually Kevin could say, hey, you're done, you're out of here, you can't do that. However, in this specific case, because of the issue and its nature, if he did anything to try to kind of put his thumb on or suppress her power in this case, she could quite literally not only sue the entire state of Nevada, the sheriff's department, but she would be able to continue doing what she's doing, which is whatever she wants, which is coming from higher ups in the Homeland Security Division. So she's been given, for lack of a better word, carte blanche. Just do whatever you want to do. You're untouchable. You can do anything you want to do when it comes to this case, which is unheard of unless there's something really going on and some have suspected that maybe this interpersonal scenario may have not i of course but allegedly may have underpinnings of you know this this whole i don't want to call it blackmail you know but uh every everybody's on the edge of their seat understood (laughs) <laughs> uh good job by the way because you 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 uh I, I think you've you've danced around an issue that without saying too much and so i think uh for your sanity and and safety we'll leave it at that uh yeah i got kids i got a family i don't want to get uh, you know it'll be a talk about a no-knock warrant <laughs> yeah yeah uh you, you you don't want any of that action in your life uh, what's this uh, redacted mm-hmm. 16 minutes of audio and video? Oh, man. I'm so glad you brought this up. This is huge. Oh, my gosh. This is huge. Okay. The foremost, okay, the foremost expert in um, computer systems, uh, the uh, communication devices, anything IT related, um, was called in uh, the one that is used by the authorities here in Nevada. The, the guy, the guy, the cleaner was called in this guy. This guy can do anything that has to do with technology. And he quite literally was called in immediately after the event. And he removed or redacted completely erased over 16 minutes of not only audio, but actually video. And where this is really stunning is, let's go out on a limb a little further, it is alleged that he may have actually removed communication from the vehicles to dispatch, as well as body camera footage in the backyard. So, We know these entities were in the backyard for roughly 38 minutes. We know police arrived on scene. Something that was very interesting when the police arrived, and if you go back through the footage, is as they enter the backyard, they say, oh, we're going to turn off our body cameras because we don't want to, like, you know, show the world what's in your backyard. Well, man, if you watch any episode of Cops or anything else broadcast all over mainstream TV networks, they don't care. They will chase you through somebody's living room. Uh, and and so this, this may have Homeland Security and, written all over it. Um, but yeah, this guy, this guy may be, uh, this might be coming out. I mean, there's so many things that if this was not a real deal, would not be taking place. You never have the official record for a case like this uh, tampered with, let alone 
audio, video, communications from actual dispatch, and body cam footage as well, removed from the record, so it just no longer exists. It's not even there. It's like, what happened in the backyard? Oh, there's nothing there. What happened on the way there? There's no communication. What's on the way back? No communication. What happened, you know, give me a break. This does not happen unless it's a very real scenario. Yeah, it's so classic too, you know, like, and they just expect people just to take it hook, line and sinker, swallow it up and, and, uh, you know, just smile and say, thank you, please can I have some more? Um, on on this list of things that you had sent over to me, what is the the nest? Is that the the circle in the backyard that you're talking about, or what? No, this is huge. Okay, this is super huge. So on these, um, there there's a lot of what we call cross agency communication, which is basically, um. Uh, what do you call it? It's basically, to give you an example, going back to Bigelow, because all roads lead to Bigelow. When I spoke with security guards that were at his property in the Uinta Basin, they would tell me that they would get paid from different departments of the military each paycheck. So this pay period, I would get paid by the Air Force. Next pay period, I would get paid by the Navy. Pay period after that would be uh, Department of Defense. Pay period after that. So the, they, they're, they're playing this shell game, right? Where even if somebody wanted to, and they've shown me the, the check stubs, like literally, you know, same amount, different department of the military. So to pull something off like that, just imagine how powerful you have to be that you get on the phone and you're like, hey, cut me a check for whatever. You're caught. I don't want to say he, you know, the big Bob in charge, but somebody is calling um, these different groups and saying, shoot me a check for this amount to pay these guys. We'll settle up later. Like, just imagine having that power. So these these crash retrieval teams, there is like a, um, there's been this MIB scenario where people say, well, what group of the government is it with? You know, is it with, DARPA? Is it with Department of Defense? Is it with the DIA? It, you know, is it with Space Force? And there's actually a group. I'm dropping bombs, dude. There is a group that when they get involved, you know, it's literally like Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones on site with their sunglasses. And when that group's involved, um, it's called the Nuclear Emergency Support Team. Nest. And they are a division of the Department of Energy. And when they get involved, that means that you have not only something of national security, but something that most likely left a radiation signature that is so important that it needs to be secured. Like secure the, like exactly what you're talking about. Like, you know, that call, like secure this, secure the area. When, when these guys come, it's the real deal. And in this particular case, according to the information that I've gathered from top level people, the Department of Energy sent a division of NEST to investigate this alongside other departments. So it's pretty heavy. So Nest is kind of like a a men in black organization. Well, yes and no, they do other things like, okay, so if we, if we have a nuclear uh, meltdown, they're going to be there. If we have a situation where there's like a radiation leak, they're going to be there. But if you have, a craft with exotic propulsion that left a nuclear radiation signature on the ground, they're going to be there. So there's no reason for them to be going to this backyard unless again, we literally have one of the, you know, the case of the century, one of the biggest deals ever. No. uh, Yeah. (laughs) And what does it stand for again? Nest and nuclear or something. Yeah, if you go to the Department of Energy websites, and there's other divisions as well. 
but it's the nuclear emergency support team. And to, to, to like kind of read you a little bit of what they do, um, they respond and leverage the Department of Energy's world-class scientists and technical experts to contend with the nation's most pressing radiological and nuclear challenges. This is their official mission statement. And uh, yeah, the top of the top um, wow. recruited to work in these divisions. It, it reminds me of like Men in Black, you know, the top of the top of the yeah. top, you know, like when they're in that. <laughs> they're hand selected with the cream of yeah. the crop. Yeah. Is there is there a connection with any kind of Men in Black organization with this? Or is that more like the government entities showing up, you know, and talking to neighbors and family members and things like that? So unless there was like, you know, they had radiation detectors and Geiger counters, and unless they they deemed it a big enough deal. So this thing, that's the other thing that the the way that this has been, usually you compartmentalize things. You don't involve everybody. But the way this thing went down, everybody started getting involved. It went from, okay, the obvious thing that we can tell, it went from Las Vegas Metro. You know, here we got a quack call of people saying they got aliens in their backyard. They probably had some drug testing kits in the back and let's go out there. It went from regular police, 911 call to Homeland Security Division, which all of a sudden, boom, red flag, red flag. That's verified. It went further up the chain to a bunch of other unnamed for the moment departments of the government and intelligence, and eventually to quite literally the mother load, the holy grail nest, which nobody knows about. And which is basically, like you said, the best of the best of the best, the top of the top of the top. And somebody had to call them and say, hey, guys, according to the alleged testimony of extremely vetted veteran of the intelligence community and someone who is. Oh, I I could just start dropping credentials and you'd be like, "Okay, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. According to this guy, Nest was there. Wow. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh, it's over. Like, it's, it's done. We'll never know anything about this. But at the same time, they were, they were a little bit shoddy in how they, this all went down. And, and an example of that is um, the sheriff and the uh, situation or um, interpersonal The thing with Sasha Larkin, the uh, head of Homeland Security. But anyway, that deal. Um, if, if, if this starts to unravel at the ends, this is going to turn into not only the, the, the UFO landing of the century and event of the century in close proximity. I mean, these, these kids, Angel and his brother, were right there looking at these things. They got a good view until they threw up the cloaking technology. And again, there's evidence that this could possibly be, this is really strange, they, they, they scanned the backyard with um, thermal cameras and devices, and apparently, sorry for that sound, and apparently there was no heat signatures, which goes into a whole other rabbit hole where these entities were either cold-blooded or uh, worse, where there is similar to what we were talking about in Peru, where there's a joint op of some sort, but there's so many rabbit holes to go down. Yeah, it, clearly there are. Um, speaking of Peru, I did look it up here, and uh, Timothy said on his Twitter, he said, uh, although I cannot say for certain who the face peeler uh, per- perpetrators are, in Peru, I can confirm, confirm, confirm unequivocally that the phenomenon is real and ongoing. My hypothesis is that they are nefarious humans with reverse engineered alien tech and possibly working with non-human factions. And so that's what I was trying to refer to earlier. Uh, on that note of what he said and what you just said, uh, and the accounts of the people involved and the, the their experiences and what they witnessed, 
Do you think that this is a situation in, in your gut where, because uh, there's there's definitely controlled operations with this stuff. There's definitely situations where um, it's planned and and the government and these these organizations know it's happening. And then there's the unplanned. Do you think that this is one of those unplanned things where it was like, this was not a cleared landing and uh, we need to investigate uh, as to what's going on? Because, you know, my my assumption is uh, there is a real rogue faction when it comes to these um, NHIs. I hate even saying that that phrase, but uh, non-human intelligence, interdimensional beings, these beings that can access our realm in many different ways. Uh, I think that humans and world elites do have operating relationships and relationship is not to be misconstrued as uh, a positive relationship. It's just a relationship. Um, but then there's, but there's order to it. And then there's these, these more rogue per se uh, experiences people have. Do you think that that might be what was going on here? Is it was it was un it was unapproved operations within our realm? Such a good question, Tony. Dude, you are like Cal Ripken. You just aim for the you know <laughs> Babe Ruth. You just knocking it out of the park. Okay, so we know. You know, I love the comment where people have said that the military industrial complex is not what it used to be. And it's literally a situation and scenario where we, we have various multiple accounts of these joint ops with non-human intelligence and the military industrial complex, whether it's cases like Bob Lazar um, we have, you know, the, the list is long and, and deep and in my opinion, there are always rogue elements like, hey, we got a runner, you know, it's, he's tired. He doesn't, he doesn't like the, he doesn't like the dessert. He doesn't like the cakes. He wants to go home, whatever it is. There are many cases and scenarios which lend credence to the possibility that these things do. I don't want to call it escape because that makes us seem like the bad guys, but, or we have a runner. These things are off radar. They're, they're no longer controllable. And when that happens, it's much like any intelligence asset. They have to be burned and uh, or taken out, erased. So it could be a literal situation of something along those lines. On the other hand, we know that the congressional testimony that was taking place, people who uh, like uh, Herrera, people like um, Eric Hecker, people like uh, anyway, there's a long list of these guys who were testifying, like bearing their souls at the time when this was released, almost as if released by these military contractors who had some hand in when it would be released to the mainstream media. And this was done to deflect from the testimony that they were talking about. And the testimony they were talking about is super important. Because they were talking about military contractors, they were naming names, names like Raytheon, Lockheed, the list goes on and on. Uh, names of these current military contractors having more power than the government because of their control and the intellectual property that they owned, which was quite literally reverse engineered non-human technology and that they were utilizing that's not the bad part if it was just that that's okay that's the crazy part legally if they are more powerful than the government because of this that's okay but the reason they were testifying is because that they were using these exotic technologies of a reverse engineered origin in illegal ways for illegal practices that's what the testimony allowed the whistleblowers to talk about. And only that. So they were utilizing this in cases like human trafficking, drug running. You know, uh, they don't need to use Air America like the 70s anymore where they're flying stuff around in a jet. They don't need to do that anymore. They have now cloaking technology on reverse engineered craft with exotic propulsion 
that they can do these clandestine ops with. And we know that these ops have happened. If you just look at the CIA and what they've been involved with, and that's just the CIA, there's departments above them. We know what they're willing to do to get a job done. And, you know, if they need funding for a war, go grab a poppy field. If they need funding for, you know, the reconstruction of a government puppet and putting somebody in place, they do what they need to do to do this. And now we have something completely foreign, for lack of a better word, to us, which is these military contractors not only targeting U.S. citizens, which is another part of the whistleblowing, but basically above the law in every way, shape, and form, even if the military, our military, wanted to do something about it, these contractors always have kind of a secret up their sleeve. They have more power than they need to have. Beware of the military-industrial complex. I think we're going to end it right there. Beware of the military-industrial complex. That is the facts. And uh, I, I think that there, this, this is a rabbit hole that I think... Are you still researching this? Yeah, yeah. And off, off air, I can, we can talk about so much more. Yeah. I, uh, I think that there's a lot of information that, <laughs> that uh, is yet to come out on this whole thing. And I think it ties into a lot of these other cases as well. Uh, I think we're living in a time where timelines and uh, storylines are being crossed. Uh, and it's, it's unavoidable at this point. And it, it takes people willing to dive into this stuff and research it on their own. The government's only going to give you what they have to give you. And so it takes independent research. Like even the person you mentioned you were out on the lake with that can't really be connected to the story, you know? Uh, it, it's it's uh, This is all fascinating. I appreciate you coming on and sharing and talking with me about it. Uh, hopefully the people enjoyed it as well. Before we end this though, uh, we didn't do this in the beginning. Tell people where they can find you and your stuff. I mean, your podcast and all that good stuff. I mean, we mentioned about Space Wolf Research. I'll say it again, spacewolfresearch.com. Check it out. Uh, but you know, you do have a podcast people should check out as well. Sure. Um as I said, I love the esoteric. The podcast is, uh, it stands for Hyper Anomalous Esoteric Research Organization Podcast. It's a smaller cast. You can find it at heroparanormal.com or on YouTube or social media. And uh, yeah, there's links to books and other things and stuff like that. Awesome. Well, everybody should check it out. Uh, Ryan, thanks for being here, man. Thank you, man. And I'll leave one last thing. Can I leave one last thing? Yeah. It's been brought to my attention, the theory that possibly these things went into the lake at that location to that ancient civilization and this now hub of intelligence, which is Vegas. You know, we have Area 51 and other major intelligence, military, industrial complex organizations out here. They maybe went down in there to kind of go back and say, we're not helping these guys with this civilization. Let's try to unwind the whole deal. Why do you say that? It's crazy. And I don't have, it's still coming in. It's still coming in. So I don't know. And they went to Peru too. So maybe they were trying to unwind it there too. And it, it reminds me of the aerial class, or, you know, the, the aerial school UFO sighting, which is another one of the most amazing sightings of the century where these, yeah. all these kids who aren't going to lie, 60 to a hundred kids. They only, I think, interviewed 80 of them that were old enough to like talk about it without crying their eyes out. Yeah. They said that these entities literally told them, beware of technology, beware of technology. And look at us all. We're just all neck deep in technology. And, and I think that sometimes we're willing to literally sell our souls for technology. Oh, for sure. Uh, we definitely bow to it and worship it. That's for sure. Yeah, so that's a stretch at the end. I have no proof of that yet. So, well, if you do, just send it my way sometime. You know, because <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's it's very interesting. But uh, thanks for thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you, Tony. Have a great day. Maybe I'm forgotten at the bottom.
has a little look too bright Do you agree? I Yeah. 